If you've ever watched the likes of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Deliverance or The Hills Have Eyes, then you'll probably think you have a good idea of what happens when humans inbreed. Namely, psychosis, murderous intentions, webbed fingers, and some pretty mean banjo playing skills. But what's the reality? Does inbreeding really lead to deformities and nasty diseases? Could inbreeding actually be a good thing? As I'm sure you know, inbreeding is defined as mating between organisms closely related through common ancestry. On the flip side, what most of us do, I hope, is the mating between unrelated organisms, or outbreeding. Time for a super quick romp through genetics. Now, the biological aim of mating is the combining of genetic material, the shuffling of DNA from two parents into one offspring. Yep, sorry guys, at its essence, mating is that romantic. Now, our DNA, our instruction manual for life, is bundled up into chunks, chapters, if you will, called chromosomes. Pretty much all of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes in most of our cells. One of the pair from your mum and one of the pair from your dad. And what you get from them determines things like your eye colour or your blood type, even dimples. It works like this. Within each of those chromosomes, those chapters of the instruction manual, are specific sentences that instruct your body what type of eye colour to produce or determine what blood type you are. These short sections of DNA that code for these specific things are called genes. But genes can come in different forms, different alleles. And which alleles you have determines whether you have, say, blue or brown eyes. On one of the chromosomes you get from your mum, you're going to have one type of gene for eye colour, and you'll partner that with the eye colour gene you get from your dad. It's the combination of those two genes that determines your eye colour. If you have the brown gene allele from either your mum or your dad, you'll have brown eyes, because that type of allele is dominant. However, the blue eyes allele is what's known as recessive. You need that recessive allele from both your mum and your dad to have blue eyes. With inbreeding, the two people mating are blood relations, so their gene pools are going to be much more similar. If one has the recessive allele for cystic fibrosis, it's more likely that their blood relative mating partner may also carry it. So the odds of their child having the two recessive alleles that predisposes them to cystic fibrosis is much greater. That is why inbreeding increases the chance of congenital defects. According to the World Health Organization, first cousin new Unions, that's producing children with any of the children of your uncles and aunts, nearly doubles the risk for neonatal and childhood death, intellectual disability and other anomalies. Whole populations that indulge in it, think of captive animals in zoos for example, begin to decrease in size as healthy mates become in short supply. That's known as inbreeding depression, and scientists have been able to closely study the effect of it by looking at the royals. Now, before you start tapping away in the comments box, I'm not pointing fingers at a modern monarchy. I'm talking about ancient dynasties like the Egyptian pharaohs or back in the Persian dynasty where brother-sister and parent-child marriages were not uncommon, usually to maintain power within bloodlines. A more recent example of this phenomena is one of the most important royal houses of Europe, the House of Habsburg. For generations, half-siblings, cousins, and even uncles and nieces were regularly marrying each other. This inbreeding culminated with the birth of Charles II of Spain in 1661. Get this, his mother was his dad's niece, and his grandmother was also his aunt. Charles II suffered from numerous disabilities and congenital abnormalities. He didn't speak until he was four, walk until he was eight, and his deformed jaw meant he could barely chew. In his later life, insanity set in, and at one point he demanded that the bodies of his family be exhumed so he could look upon their corpses. When he finally died, at the young age of 38, his autopsy stated that his body did not contain a drop of blood. His heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous, his head full of water. Oh and he had a single testicle that was as black as coal. Cracking story, but worth noting that not all these things can be fully put down to inbreeding. Pituitary hormone deficiency and distal renal tubular acidosis are caused by recessive alleles and could explain a fair few of those symptoms I just described, though it's very rare to be afflicted with both simultaneously. Right, that's the downsides of inbreeding. 
are there any benefits? Well, if you're into laboratory testing, then you'll like your mice to be inbred because you want them to be as genetically alike as possible. And it's big business. One company in America has over 100 different strains of inbred mice you can purchase. But what about outside the lab? Well, there are some creatures in the animal kingdom that have made incest part of their life cycle in order to ensure reproductive success. A particular adult female Hawaiian mite keeps its eggs inside her until they have reached maturity. The first few eggs to hatch are male, and then they lay in wait outside their mother's genital opening for their little sisters to hatch, and then they instantly get down to business. And how about dog breeding? There, inbreeding is deliberately used to try and develop prized traits in new puppies, like size or fur type. I should say though, actually, that breeds aren't scientifically defined. They're just categories created by dog breeders to describe groupings of dogs by characteristics. However, a recent scientific study headed by Professor David Balding showed that a large proportion of pedigree dogs do suffer illnesses caused by recessive alleles, including heart disease, abnormal development of hip joints and deafness. The study also showed that due to dog inbreeding, a population of 20,000 boxer dogs only had the genetic variety of 70-ish, so the issues around this kind of dog breeding do far outweigh any perceived benefits. Us humans have been doing the same with all sorts of livestock for thousands of years too. Without knowledge of how inbreeding can be used to increase milk yields or create the fluffiest sheep for wool, human civilization might not have made it as far as it has. But in general, where humans are concerned, our advice here at BritLab is, if you're looking for love, find someone you have a lot in common with, but draw the line at DNA.